good morning to everyone and thank you uh, not only for being here this late but also to, for, to be uh, so skillful to find this room which is very well hidden uh, in the second floor of the uh, of the complex so uh, my name is Luca Belli I'm professor of internal governance and regulation at FGV law school and I have the pleasure to head the cyber bricks project that was at the origin of this of the submission of this uh, workshop uh, proposal that then became this workshop uh, if you want uh, to know more about what we do in the CyberBricks project and how we analyze uh, digital policies in the BRICS, so Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, I invite you to visit cyberbricks.info. And also in a couple of weeks, we will have uh, ready our book on uh, mapping uh, cybersecurity in the BRICS. Uh, and it will be, of course, uh, released uh, in open access for you to use it, uh, to read it, and also to, re to use it to do uh, further research. Uh, so let me provide you a couple of, before introducing my distinguished panelists, uh, let me provide you a couple of uh, uh, useful uh, pieces of information to understand what we have been doing. Uh, the basic assumption from which we started is that uh, BRICS, countries, although they uh, have been meeting for more than 10 years, uh, there is a desert of research with regard to digital policies. Uh, and the reason, are, uh, the reason is twofold. Uh, first of all, there is, uh, uh, unfortunately, things are changing now with further commitment to cooperation, but with regard to policy research, there is still very few uh, projects, initiatives, uh, doing so in the BRICS area. Hard sciences are developing cooperation much better. Uh, uh, human sciences still have uh, to, to catch up. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the digital policies of the BRICS have been really shaped over the past five or six uh, years for the majority of them. Uh, an example uh, that illustrates very well why we have been thinking about this project is uh, data regulation, the reason we have been organizing this uh, workshop. Over the past two or three years, all BRICS countries have either completely renewed, updated, or elaborated new uh, regulatory frameworks on data protection. Uh, the landmark uh, moment that can mark this transi transition is the Xiamen Declaration in 2017 BRICS meeting. After that, all of them have, st have started coincidentally to uh, adopt or update their political and uh, sorry their, their regulatory framework. The, uh, in Brazil, there has been new data protection legislation adopted last year, entering force next year, and a new data protection authority will be established. Russia. Uh, has updated the Data Protection Act. India has declared a new fundamental right to privacy in the Puttaswamy case in 2017 that has triggered the elaboration of new data protection bill that is going to be discussed in the coming weeks. Uh, China has adopted not only a cybersecurity legislation that tackles data protection, but also has further specified it in the data uh, security specifications, and also introduced a new right to data protection in the general norms for uh, the new uh, civil code. And last but not uh, least, of course, South Africa has created a new data protection uh, regulator a couple of years ago that is now tasked with the, uh, the duty to implement POPI, the Privacy of, Inform of Personal Inf Information Act. A lot of things happening. Uh, for uh, a group of countries that includes 3.2 billion people, which is 42% of the uh, world population, and where four out of five BRICS are in the top five of the countries which the most mobile internet users, uh, where the internet of things is already happening, a reality where data are gathered, processed continuously, and therefore uh, data protection frameworks are badly needed both to, reg to protect individuals' rights and, of course, also to guarantee a stable, uh, foreseeable environment for businesses. Now, uh, having said that, I would like to introduce my distinguished panelists, starting in BRICS order, of course, uh, from Ambassador Achilles Zalwar, 
who is director of the uh, technology and science and technology department at the Brazilian uh, um, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, and then uh, Professor Andrei Shcherbovich from the uh, Higher School of Economics of Moscow, uh, uh, Anya Kovac, directress of the Internet Democracy Project India, uh, Min Jiang uh, for, from the professor at the uh, uh, University of Charlotte in the US, and uh, sadly, uh, uh, Dirk Dermaltino from NASPERS group could not participate, so we will have a BRICS uh, panel, uh, hoping that in, this, in the room there are people from South Africa providing inputs, otherwise we will provide our opinion on South Africa. And then, of course, last but not least, uh, Peter Kaimpar, uh, that uh, works for the Council of Europe, uh, an intergovernmental organization uh, of which the of which Russia is, of course, a member, that will also help us provide a broader perspective on and may put this into uh, the, the ideas that we will discuss into perspective with regard to the uh, European uh, context. So, without further ado, I would like to ask to Ambassador uh, Achilles Alwar to uh, open the dance, uh, presenting about the latest evolution in Brazil. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Belli. Yeah. Um, I will follow more or less uh, the, the order of the questions that you emailed us before, so we can uh, kind of uh, share the basic knowledge uh, about the national policies of, uh, of each of our countries, and then, uh, of course, we'll be ready for, to, to debate. Uh, just a, a quick background. Uh, Brazil has over 140 million Internet user, its, users. It's the largest uh, internet market in Latin America and the fourth largest in the world in the number of user, if, users, I think, after China, India, and the United States. Uh, and just in August last year, 2018, we approved our first uh, comprehensive data protection law. It's called in Portuguese the Lei Geral de Proteção de Dados, uh, General Law of the, for da Data Protection or acronym in Portuguese, LGPD. So uh, I will be using this LGPD acronym to, to refer to it. It's the Brazilian Data Protection Law. Then in December last year, uh, the former president of Brazil issue, issued a, a, a what called provisional measure. Provisional measure. It's a, it's a, a kind of a dec decree of the force of law that has to be reviewed by Congress which makes some amendments to the LGPD. And uh, most importantly, it, it creates Brazil's first national data protection authority, the ANPD, ANDP. It's, it's so, so full of acronyms. I had, to, to, had a hard time memorizing them myself. So uh, essentially, last year, 2018, we had uh, our first data protection law. And then at the end of the year, uh, we amended it to include the creation of the data protection authority. They need to, this went to, to Congress again, and uh, I take the opportunity to acknowledge the presence uh, here in this room of uh, a, 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 delegate, a parliamentary delegation from Brazil. This is Senator Amin there, Dep Deputada Angela Amin, Deputada Carla Zambelli, if I'm not seeing the others, but uh, it's a sign of the interest that uh, the Brazilian Congress uh, uh, and civil society uh, has taken uh, uh, on this issue, uh, especially in the last uh, two years. Uh, so, the, the, so in July, uh, we had the final version of the, of the data protection law. Uh, uh, it, it, it has some, uh, some revisions. Huh? Uh, it will enter into force. The law was approved, but there is a kind of grace period. It will enter into force in August 2020, so nine months from now. Uh, and, then, uh, and then starting in August, uh, the Data Protection Authority will be uh, responsible for overseeing the data protection regulation. Uh, this leaves uh, uh, many organizations, many businesses, many companies, approximately, well, less than 10 months uh, uh, to assess the impact of the law on their data processing activities and operations to devise and execute uh, implementation strategies and to make changes relevant to their business pr processes, compl compliance infrastructures, and IT systems. That's a lot of, uh, of work. There is a, a, biz a whole business that has 
flourished around it and helping the companies to adapt themselves to the requirements of the of the new law. Um, and uh, for uh, for many of these businesses and organizations and uh, government agencies, etc., uh, there will be a, a this will be an opportunity to transform their approach to data protection and data management and uh, to adapt it to put it to line with the digital the modern digital economy uh, uh, and uh, to use it as also as an opportunity to to uh, 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 take part in, in, in the opportunities that uh, the, the, the digital, digital economy brings. Uh, for the authority, the new authority, 2020 will be the first cycle of uh, regulatory data protection and, uh, and enforcement power. And uh, I'm betting that it will be also a learning experience for the, for the authority. For, uh, as it is for businesses and also for the Brazilian judiciary. Uh, so that's, it's all hands on, de on deck to, to ensure the effectiveness of the, of the national authority <coughs> and uh, uh, bring it uh, uh, the whole of the Brazilian economy uh, into line with the realities of the, of the digital world and the, 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 now the legal requirements for, for data privacy. Uh, you made, uh, Professor Bell, you made a series of questions. I, I don't know if I, I leave to, this, this is just a general introduction. I may leave the answer to the, 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 the particular questions to later. How, what, what do you say? Yeah. <coughs> it's fine to have some points to discuss in the debate. So if you want, we can further discuss it's, them. It's the thing about the application to foreign entities, uh -huh. extraterritorial. I can if you want to start to give a short overview now, otherwise we can okay. go to, uh, with the uh, other panelists and then so discuss this later. The law has both a transversal and multi-sectoral application, means, meaning that it applies both to the public and the private sectors. It applies online as it applies offline. It also has extraterritorial application, meaning that uh, websites, companies, or organizations that process personal data from individuals in Brazil are bound to comply with the law, regardless of where in the world they are owned or operated from. Uh, Article 3 defines that the, the LGPD applies to, one, data processing within the territory of Brazil, two, data processing of individuals that are within the territory of Brazil, regardless of where in the world the data processor is located. So if you're outside Brazil, but you're processing data from Brazilians, you have to comply with the law or else. Three, data processing of data collected in Brazil. Uh, so that's a pretty ambitious uh, uh, scope, but I think it's, it's more or less in line with what's happening elsewhere. Uh, there is also, as you mentioned about India, also in, in, in about the creation of a fundamental right. Uh, the LGPD defines a data subject as a natural person to whom the personal data that are the object of processing refer. That is, an individual whose data is being collected and or processed is a data subject. Then the LGPD empowers data subjects with nine rights. Defined, please don't ask me exactly what the nine are. Uh, but. Uh, yeah. I'm sure they're important. It defines what constitutes personal data, and I can check it here if, if somebody has. Uh, and creates 10 legal bases for, 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 for suing somebody, you know. Uh, it also puts the responsibility on companies or organizations to appoint a data protection officer, a DPO, uh, to, who will interact with the national authority. Uh, there are provisions for sensitive health data, uh, and uh, my last uh, observation would be that many of the, of the provisions and changes introduced uh, in the law uh, uh, are parallel to Euro the European Union's GDPR requirements, including the rules about uh, extraterritorial scope, expanded individual rights, uh, requirement to appoint a DPO, uh, data protection officer, DPO, rules about risk and breach notification, rules surrounding data transfers. There are also some differences, which we can uh, discuss later. Uh, but uh, it is not inaccurate to say that uh, uh, the, the new law uh, brings Brazil relatively close 
to the model of, uh, of the European Union. Uh, there are a few differences, a few technical issues that I'm sure Professor Abelli, who is based in Brazil, you're Brazilian, right? Or, or you have nationality already? I am both Italian and Brazilian. Okay, yes, you're so, Brazilian. Yes. So I'm sure Professor Abelli uh, uh, understands even better than I. So if there is a particularly tough question, I'll deflect it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, also, uh, let me also welcome the uh, delegation from Brazil, telling them that if they want at any moment to chip into the discussion and provide their thoughts or ask any question, they are absolutely more than welcome to participate in the discussion. Now, proceeding in, in BRICS order, I would like to ask to uh, Andrei Shushabovich to provide some insight of what, uh, about what is happening in Russia. Uh, thank you, Professor Belli. And uh, first of all, I'd like to mention that uh, this is my work, which was completed uh, during the uh, CyberBricks Fellowship in Rio de Janeiro in f uh, Faculty of Law of uh, Fundação Getúlio Vargas uh, uh, University, uh, where I have an opportunity to make the cybersecurity and data protection in BRICS countries, in particular in my country. And uh, I'd like to tell you some f basic features about uh, data protection legislation in the Russian Federation. Uh, first of all, we have the law on personal data, which, uh, of course, have the basic reason to protect privacy of uh, Russian citizens, but also have another functions. Uh, uh, for protection of so-called public interests, so like uh, economic, social, and other po political functions. And uh, the basic reason for this legislation is to provide a balance between ensuring privacy and ensuring other interests of public nature, uh, but this is the major feature of uh, Russian legislation, that it always cares about public interests. Uh, first of all, I would like to know the uh, rules of processing and uh, how to process personal data. Uh, first of all, we need uh, the con uh, informed consent for uh, Transmission of personal data, uh, this consent should be in written for, uh, observed in written form. Uh, in all cases and all occasions, you need to write down the form in, in which you agree to uh, give away your personal data. Uh, and also, uh, this legislation should care about leg leg legitimate purposes of processing of personal data. Uh, it's not uh, possible to uh, collect personal data without any specific legitimate purpose. It's uh, also a specific feature of Russian legislation. It's not possible to mix or combine databases with personal data that are collected for different purposes. Also, uh, the, uh, we should also care about the relevance of the personal data, and uh, operators should take any necessary measures to keep this data updated or uh, delete them in case there is no need for collecting them anymore. Uh, and here there's the fifth property that uh, personal data should be collected no longer than purpose of proce processing of personal data required this. Uh, we have some exemptions for, from, the federal, uh, from the federal law, for example, personal data which, which, is, collect, uh, which, which is collected for, by individuals for family personal needs. Uh, Another uh, exemption is uh, personal data which is collected for the purpose of archive legislation, special, special legislation for, of archival funds. Uh, it's not suitable for uh, collection of personal data. Other uh, specific, per, uh, specific rules could be implied when personal data is collected uh, in case of 
fulfilling the unified register of individual entrepreneurs and uh, of course uh, special rules uh, which are overwhelming for everything is uh, when these personal data uh, constitute state secrets of Russian Federation. We have special categories of personal data, is any uh, kind of uh, legislation. Uh, this uh, personal data of these categories could not be collected. This is uh, personal data concerning race, nationality, political opinions, philosophic and religious views, health condition, and intimate life. Uh, it's not uh, possible to collect this kind of personal data in any, uh, in any, uh, or any kind, with some exceptions, of course. But in general, it's not possible to collect these specialized categories of personal data. This is Roscomnadzor, which is authority uh, authorized for uh, control and sphere of personal data in any other spheres in, uh, in internet governance. For example, blocking and filtering of websites. So this is uh, major, one of the major purpose of the Roscomnadzor. Uh, it keeps, first of all, it keeps operate, uh, it keeps registry of operators of personal data and it keeps registry of violators of legislation of personal data. Uh, I will uh, tell you about what will happen in case of uh, this violation, uh, in case of this violation. For example, in the Council of Europe uh, Convention, we are, are uh, <clears throat> remember, but the Roscomnadzor is authority, uh, the convention prescribes that authority uh, in sphere of personal data should be independent, but uh, the Roscomnadzor is structurally dependent from uh, the Minister of Mass Communications, and that's why uh, Russian Federation is the country uh, where, uh, which is not uh, suitable for appropriate data protection in, in, in accordance with this, in this, uh, in this convention. Uh, the major problem in uh, legislation of personal data in Russia is localization of personal data. Uh, personal data of Russian citizens should be localized on servers inside the Russian Federation. Uh, uh, that's why uh, some companies are quitting Russian markets uh, just for uh, economic uh, for economic reasons that are uh, it's not possible for them to rent servers inside of, ter of the territory of the Russian Federation to collect personal data of Russian citizens. Uh, there is the uh, process of blocking of the violator websites. Uh, the major feature is the 15 days that is given to the organizer of dissemination of information to correct the violation. In other, uh, in, uh, in, in case the, this violation would not be corrected, uh, Ros Roskomnadzor is able to block the website that contains, uh, that contains violation of, of legislation of personal data of uh, Russian citizens. Uh, lots of critique for this uh, legislation, for this data protection legislation. Russia is not unique, unique in localization of personal data, but uh, uh, there is lots of critiques uh, from the uh, non-governmental organizations, from the independent uh, international organizations, that it limits freedom on the internet, actually. Uh, this is how this registry looks like. It's not possible to uh, see the whole register. It's just as possible to search in, this, in the registry in case this or that particular website is uh, a violator of the personal data regime. Uh, there are some problems of implementation of this law. Some economic experts counted that uh, the country's GDP will decrease by the, uh, in case of uh, implementation of this law. 
Uh, this uh, law creates major problems in cross-border uh, transfer of personal data. Uh, and of course, it's not possible to establish nationality of internet user. Uh, in some cases, it's possible to uh, enter any kind of nationality. And of course, uh, it's, uh, the bypassing of this blocking is very simple by using VPN, Tor mechanisms on anonymizers and other things like that. Uh, there is the uh, issues how to determine uh, possible Russian jurisdiction over, over websites when website is used to a domain name associated with the Russian Federation, for example, .ru, .su, .moscow, uh, usage of Russian language uh, without automatic translation. So, uh, that means that website is uh, uh, devoted for Russian citizens uh, and um, is market-oriented uh, market for Russian citizens. And uh, uh, also payment in Russian rubles are also possible. This is uh, the possibility for strengthening governmental control over uh, internet activities. And uh, head of Roscommonsor said uh, we will continue strictly implement this law. Uh, the only major victim here is LinkedIn, which is complete banned, uh, completely banned in Russia for violation of this personal data legislation. So it's not possible to use the LinkedIn social network in the Russian Federation. I can see there is, that is possibility for other uh, social networks that, is, uh, that will not uh, implement this data localization law. If you have questions, I can answer in the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andre. And, uh, yeah. Sorry if I stopped the enthusiasm of the clapping. Uh, and actually, I, I suggest uh, we have another presentation, and we open for a couple of questions, and then we keep on with the other presentations, and then we open for the uh, debate. So please, in BRICS order, Anya. <laughs> Thank you, Luca. And as always, it's a delight to be on a BRICS panel. I think uh, it's really positive to have, in a meeting like this, panels that foreground Global South perspectives. And I'm going to approach my comments slightly different maybe than the previous speakers. I got inspired by the previous session I was watching, which was the one on digital sovereignty, and where I was very grateful that the ambassador was there to put some of these Global South questions on the table. And I think a lot of what you raised actually in your comments is also the broader framework in which the debate around data protection legislation in India really has to be located. So what I want to do is first talk a little bit about our draft data protection bill. I'm going to talk about the draft that was released in 2018. We know that right now in Parliament it, it's announced that the bill is going to be introduced. We know that there will be changes, but that version is not public, so I can't say anything about it, sadly. Um, and then secondly, I want to talk a little bit about why it looks the way it looks. Um, we've had in India in the past two years a lot of initiatives actually that touch on data, not just this draft data protection bill. Um, and that has generated a lot of enthusiasm. Some have called the draft data protection, personal data protection bill in India a GDPR light. Um, but at the Internet Democracy Project, we think that really that is too generous uh, an assessment of the law. And there are three areas in particular that I want to highlight as very serious weaknesses of a bill like that in the digital age. The first one is that the draft in India does not have any next generation rights at all. With that I mean rights that actually address big data questions, right? So the right to explanation on automated decisions, for example, or the right to object to processing of personal data when it's done in the name of public interest or legitimate interest or the right to object to processing based on your gender for direct marketing. All of these have been included in the GDPR. We don't have any of these that actually address the new challenges that come with big data in the draft law in India. A second area I wanted to touch upon um, is around consent. And basically the way consent has been framed is what um, at the Internet Democracy Project we call the benevolent patriarch. So, um, consent is seen as a ground for processing, but it only operates as long as the benevolent patriarch agrees, so there is a ton of exceptions. Um, 
when it comes to private entities in general, a lot of consent is left or kind of weakened by provisions that say that data processing after consent has been uh, given is still allowed based on what is fair and reasonable. <coughs> But what is fair and reasonable in the digital age is precisely one of the reasons why we are having all of these debates. And to leave it to a data protection authority to then decide what is actually fair and reasonable is really just passing the buck. So it's an undermining of the consent provision right there. We also have in the same law um, specific uh, provisions that give very broad leeway to employers to collect data without consent from uh, their employees, including for all forms of assessment of their labor, which nowadays can be almost anything, um, as well as provisions that actually give the state the right to collect data without consent uh, for any benefits that the state provides, as well as for the provision uh, of any certificates, etc., uh, by the state. So again, this is a really, really broad uh, um, ambit, actually, for the, for the government to collect data of people. This is especially important because when we come to the third big area of weakness is that of state surveillance. Now, in the original version of the bill that we saw last year, it's important to know that there were also uh, horizontal provisions for data localization in this bill, where at least a copy of, every, uh, of all data would have to be stored on a server within India. It seems that there are rumors that that might actually not go through in the current version of the bill, so that there might be a much more narrow form of data localization. But even without the data localization provision, um, there is very, state surveillance is a very strong exception within the bill. Uh, uh, surveillance is a ground for exception of most of the provisions of the bill. Uh, the surveillance supposedly has to be necessary and proportionate. It's good that that's in the language of the draft, but we have very little uh, checks and balances in India to indicate what necessary and proportionate means. So this is going to be lit uh, litigated. Um, and as a non-lawyer, I don't really have the patience to wait another 10 years to see what comes out of that, right? We're going to set new habits around this, and that's quite dangerous. What's also important is that the state and the bill is really treated as a unitary entity. And that is important because if you see that the government actually has the right to collect so much data uh, from its citizens, and that we have in other aspects to, for the provision of benefits, and that we have in other laws uh, provisions that actually allow surveillance agencies to uh, access metadata, for example, for the investigation of any offense or the prevention of any offense, then you can see that even the, the provisions that have to do with benefits that the government provides actually indirectly can be a way to uh, serve the surveillance engine of the Indian government. And as a user pro um, uh, perspective, that's just not strong enough a protection. Now, how is this possible? Like, um, I think Luca mentioned in the beginning, we had a very strong judgment from the Supreme Court in 2017, reconfirming that the Indian people have a right to privacy under the uh, Constitution, even though we don't have an article as such in the Constitution. And what you've seen is that actually when it comes to protection of privacy online in India, in the, since then we've had a few amazing verdicts that really strengthen people's rights to self-determination and autonomy. You could see a conspiracy theory in this, but what we argue at the Internet Democracy Project is actually that this kind of under focus on uh, collecting data from people really is an extension of the Silicon Valley thinking around data as a resource, as something that is simply out there. And now coming back to the previous session and some of the comments that the ambassador made, if we actually, if data is really a resource, I think it is no surprise that definitely for a country at, like India, where you have a market big enough for India to be able to capitalize on that data itself, to want to do that and to frame laws accordingly to actually make that possible. For us then, the challenge here is not simply that perhaps our government doesn't always take rights, uh, seriously enough, because like I said, I think that context of growth and development is important and the opportunities that data provides 
to, to increase growth and development are important. But what's really at stake here is how we conceptualize data in the first place. And that is a challenge that I think we see more visibly in a country like India, but that actually is just as relevant in Europe, for example. The problem is that we have erased people, and specifically people's bodies and the embodied experience of data and the implications that has on their lives from the way we frame our legislations around these issues. I'm happy to say more about that later if people uh, have questions, but I'll leave it here for now. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anya. And uh, I would like to open the floor uh, for a couple uh, of questions. The presentations so far have been quite thought-provoking, so I will take two or three questions to have a little bit of debate, and then we can uh, pass to the other segment. Yes, I see a hand here and one there. And yes, let's, let's start with these two, please. Uh, hello, uh, Thiago. I am a Brazilian researcher and also am currently working in the European Data Protection Supervisor. My question is specifically for the Brazilian government representative, uh, so to Mr. Achilles. Uh, I would be delighted if you could provide us some information on the EU Mercosur agreement, and I will make the specific question that I want. Uh, so. Well, some information has been already published, like uh, as I access the European Commission information on the agreement. Uh, it says that it focuses on the manufacturing industry, but it also covers like uh, ICT equipments and uh, uh, car, uh, cars and uh, telecommunication service. So many, uh, many part of a lot of industry that's connected with this digital economy as well, and. I didn't f f find, I don't know if it was my failure, any information if like data protection has been considered an issue so far in this particular agreement. And what I see here, the only information was something that says that it will become easier for Mercosur to export to the EU as far as they respect the EU high standards. Very general because we are talking about many regulations on the EU high standards. And my question for this panel, it's like specifically to the data protection regulation. We had another, let's take another question there and then we can go back to the panel. I, yeah, please go ahead. Okay, so hello, I'm a student from Hong Kong. We understand that it is advisory to have regulations about data protection and every country should do this. There are United Nations initiatives, the GDPR and Convention 108 plus in Europe, etc. However, there are always different stances when we view from different perspectives, speaking for different stakeholders. For tech giants, including search engines or smart device manufacturers, they prefer looser regulation which benefit their businesses, while for academic experts, they prefer stricter regulation which better protect our privacy. How much should companies that will be affected by the framework participate in the establishment of our data protection framework Thank you. Good question. We don't have any other questions at this point. I will uh, ask the panelists to provide some quick replies so that then in the, after a couple of uh, exchanges we can come back to presentations. Uh, Ambassador Achilles, I think you had a direct question. Thank you. I answered the question of, uh, I'm sorry, what's your name again? Tiago. Tiago, the question of Tiago. It's amazing the number of Tiagos that work with the internet in Brazil. I know, I know six or seven of them, more or less. Uh, 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 no, the, the, in the, in the, as far as I understand, in the current uh, Mercosur-European Union agreement, uh, the, this issue of uh, data protection is not uh, sufficiently regulated. Uh, you know that the final text has not yet been published, uh, the, just the guidelines and the, uh, the, the, the still fine-tuning, fine but I doubt that there will be more than what you, you mentioned. Uh, uh, for us to, to, to facilitate uh, digital uh, 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 trade between Brazil and the EU, it will be necessary to, to, to negotiate and sign an additional agreement. Uh, whereby each side recognizes the, the, digit, the data protection uh, standards of the other side as essentially equivalent or sufficiently equivalent uh, uh, to, the, to those of the other side. And uh, 
realistically, probably to, to boil down to the European Union uh, uh, assessing the, 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 the Brazilian system and, and, and its implementation. Uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, the, uh, the general philosophy of uh, the, the Brazilian law uh, is uh, close to the, the, the general philosophy of the European law, certainly much more than uh, uh, what happens uh, uh, in the, in the other BRICS. Uh, there may be uh, some uh, issues uh, about uh, the design of the data protection agency. That's what I, I, I heard in informal conversations, whether it's sufficiently independent or whether... Uh, but the, the, the design of the Brazilian National Data Protection Agency is, itself is not completed. It's still in the process of being implemented. And uh, the issue has been is being discussed in Brasilia, uh, f has been discussed for the past several months, and I think it will still be discussed. The 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 the, the, the setting up uh, uh, of the data protection agency has started around the the what we call in Brazil the Casa Civil, which is equivalent of the so part of the of the, of the presidency, uh, and and they are designing it, and uh, certainly. The, this consideration of facilitating uh, uh, for Brazilian companies to operate uh, 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 in other markets will be will certainly will be will be a consideration. For if you don't do that, what happens, for instance, if uh, uh, let's let's think about uh, laboratory exams, medical exams, for instance, uh, to process medical exams in Brazil uh, from patients in Europe, uh, I'm pretty sure that you have to comply with the European uh, uh, data protection standards and you know who has the right to look at the, at the exams, who, uh, what are, the, what are the, 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 the consequences if you fail to protect the privacy of the patient. And this is just an, one example of the hundreds of, uh, of issues that will have to be addressed uh, when the time comes to, to uh, Regulamentar, how do you say that in English? To, to no, regulate. To, to pass, the, the, to, to pass the, the, the subsidiary uh, regulations uh, that will exist under the law. So if you, you sound like a, a, a young, ambitious professional, I think you'll have work for the next 20 to 30 years if you, still, if you stay in this field. Mm -hmm. I would like also to abuse my position of moderator to provide a comment on what you were saying, that actually the BRICS uh, analysis is very useful also in this regard because, uh, for instance, if we take Russia as an example, uh, Russia did not receive adequacy decision from the European Commission uh, precisely uh, because the uh, uh, agency, the, the Roscomnazor, the Data Protection Agency, is not considered as independent, which is an essential requirement to provide adequacy uh, decision under uh, Article 47 of the, of the GDPR, and in, this is, is something that should make uh, Brazilian lawmakers uh, think uh, about the revision of the uh, new Brazilian Data Protection Authority that is, uh, should, can, let's say can, according to the law, can happen in two years. It's not sure it will, but it can happen, and so although now the Brazilian Data Protection Authority has been conceived as part of the presidency, so not as a fully independent body. It will be, it can be reviewed in a couple of years, and I think that if the Russian example is of any use, Brazilian lawmaker will uh, consider seriously the creation of an independent body to have adequacy decision and to guarantee free flow of data between Brazil and the EU. Now, sorry if I. Uh, speak too much, I will let the panelists <laughs> reply to the second question about, yes, please me. Thank you for the students from Hong Kong for raising the uh, fantastic question. And it's really wonderful to have students at these kinds of events and panels. Um, and I think a lot of the adults in the room would agree that the internet right now is really messy and messed up. Um, and uh, it's good to hear from your voices and hear, uh, you know, uh, share your thoughts about what, what we need to do. Uh, quick response to your questions about the concentration um, of power in the hands of few monopolies in the United States. We have roughly four corporations. Um, 
controlling uh, to a great extent uh, what people around the world, billions of people, can see and can um, access. And uh, you know, recently, um, I I would recommend uh, the audience here to watch a, a brilliant takedown uh, offered by. Uh, <coughs> Sasha Baron Cohen uh, recently on Facebook, and uh, it's a beautiful takedown. And he basically dismantled the idea that the Silicon Six, six people at these four corporations, should determine how billions of people should access the information. It's a really problematic model, and um, that has been called into question. Uh, but I also want to raise the point that, you know, in addition to corporations, we have states around the world. Um, also increasingly asserting control over their sphere of influence. Um, so um, perhaps this is another point for discussion later on. Um, thank you very much. Um, I would like also on my behalf thank you the students raising this question. And I'm pretty happy that you uh, started understanding of the essence of, of passing uh, valuable legislation. And I have some good news and bad news for you uh, on behalf, from the Council of Europe. The Secretary General last year decided to exchange a letter of agreement with um, major internet companies and their associations, and uh, which opened a way for, uh, for a cooperation uh, with our committees, including the Committee of Convention 108 on data protection. This is the good news. The bad news is that nothing happened uh, nothing much happened uh, since. Um, I think there are some um, more diplomatic answer and, and maybe more cynical answer to this. Uh, I leave you choose between them. But um, I think that the intention, even if the intention is there, there are lots of questions how to instrumentalize this. And for, for, for this, we need additional um, efforts from both sides. I just want to respond to this question as well, specifically in the context of a data protection debate in India. Um, because I think, first of all, no matter how much we talk about multi-stakeholderism in the IGF, things like a data protection law, are those are decisions taken by a government, right? And so at most what the government will do is consult. Now the question is who are they going to consult? And I think this is actually a really, really important question. If you look at the debate around our data protection law, the data lo localization requirements were proposed as a, a move against those big six. It's very interesting to know that some of the richest Indian industrialists who are quite close to the prime minister also already have prepared to set up massive data centers, which they are going to make a lot of money out of. Then, actually, the startup scene in India got involved in the debate and said, but if you're doing this, for us, the costs are going to be so high that the ecosystem in India is never going to be able to develop in the same way, right? So I think it's really important to think about which companies get involved, and related to that, also then to have a transparent and open debate. Because I think part of the challenge with many of uh, a lot of business involvement is that uh, big companies often have a direct line to a ministry, for example, and what is said is not made public. And if you have public consultations in which everybody actually has to make their inputs into this policy process uh, public, you can have a real national debate about how do all these interests of both companies and citizens come together. Because it's not like companies are not outside of that, right? Having a flourishing economy benefits people. Excellent. So, uh, very interesting conversation. Yes, sorry. Andre, just one minute uh, so that we, then we can uh, pass to the second segment. Please go ahead. Uh, just to make sure that uh, the principal multi stakeholders here should be ensured. And uh, uh, also, I would like to mention dependence of the Russian internet companies on the Russian let's say government and the governmentally controlled business so this is question of the third level of regulation and of course to uh, make this regulation effective we need to improve and implement the multi-stakeholder approach thank you very much excellent
extent. So now we can pass to the uh, second segment of this panel uh, with uh, the presentation of Professor Ming Jiang. Thank you, Luca, for including me um, in this conversation. Uh, China, as you uh, may know, uh, like many other countries, has been formulating its own approach towards personal data protection, um, in part in response to GDPR. So my remarks here will focus on two questions. One, uh, what, why does China's approach to personal data protection matter here? And second, what are some of the key features of China's current data protection policies? So first, uh, China's approach to personal data matters a lot um, economically and politically. To provide some context, China has the world's largest internet population of 850 million users, almost three times the internet population in the United States, and more than 10 times the internet population that we have in Germany. So this large user base has uh, really um, supported a really robust uh, internet industry in China. In fact, with companies uh, well known around the world like Huawei, ZTE, Alibaba, Tencent, and TikTok recently, China has developed um, over the past 25 years the only alternative um, digital ecosystem that can rival Silicon Valley's in both size and sophistication. Also strategically and politically, if data is now more valuable than oil, then China has really lots of it, and it is, it is really feeling um, the, um, it, the development of its technological industry in areas, especially um, as AI. Uh, China's successful state-driven uh, AI program is now seen by uh, countries like the United States as a strategic and security threat. Uh, so we're witness, what we're witnessing now is a new kind of uh, Sputnik moment that is driving uh, the ongoing US-China tech rivalry centered around AI and 5G and accelerating the technological decoupling of the two countries. So next, let me turn to the evolution of China's uh, personal data protection policies and highlight some key features. Uh, it's not hard to see that China took a very centralized, systematic, and gradual approach here. Uh, Policymaking has largely been coordinated through a newly created um, uh, policy-making body called the Cyberspace Administration of China. It's an inter-ministry um, policy-making body headed by the Chinese president himself. So this um, policy-making body passed uh, in 2017 uh, the foundational cybersecurity law of China, which includes uh, a very broad set of language about personal data protection. In the same year, uh, a technical standard called personal information security specification was released uh, with, more spe uh, with more detailed provisions. So the specification, which is very, very similar uh, to GDPR, uh, it needs to be recognized uh, for sure for its um, uh, details, but at the same time, uh, it is a technical standard that lacks the GDPR's legal status, uh, what I call you know, China's GDPR 1.0. Uh, the situation here, I think, is going to change very quickly, uh, very soon, as drafts of two important new laws were released earlier this year. The first one is uh, called the Data Security Administrative Measures aimed at regulating personal data within China. The other one is Measures on Security Assessment of the Cross-Border Transfer of Personal Information, which targets, of course, uh, cross-border data transfer. So several aspects of these developments uh, stood out to me regarding China's personal data protection policies. First, uh, first of all, China has not historically been a very strong champion or advocate for personal data protection and privacy. So these new measures are both an answer to GDPR, but also a necessity if the government in China is trying to put its arms around data in China. Um, and also to those who say the Chinese people don't care about privacy, um, I think these new laws are providing new legal instruments for citizens to push back, especially on internet companies when they cross the line. So recently, as a matter of fact, 
the Chinese public has successfully pressured firms such as Ant Financial, a uh, Alibaba subsidiary and deep fake app called Zhao to change their privacy settings and um, protect user rights. Second, I do think the Chinese government has a, uh, has a really genuine interest to bring order to a very chaotic data market by decreasing uh, business malpractice and protecting user rights. Doing so also helps the government uh, to make the case that they represent and champion the people. Third, China's new data protection policies, um, I need to point out, do not negate government control over user data. In fact, if anything, they attempt to do the very opposite. The government has done so by leaving a giant loophole in the related legislation that allows authorities to con collect and use personal information without user consent or inspect network operators and demand them to turn over user data to safeguard things like national security, public interest, social stability, and economic regulation. So this gives, as you can tell, the government a very um, immense latitude, right? But also, it is a problem because foreign security regimes are now arguing that Chinese companies like Huawei cannot be trusted. Okay. So this is a kind of catch-22 situation. I think it's very difficult for the government and for uh, Chinese tech giants when they go abroad to uh, wiggle out of. Fourth, similar to many other countries, uh, like Russia and India, China um, has introduced data localization provisions. Uh, the current draft of the Chinese cross-border data transfer law specifically requires foreign network operators that collect Chinese uh, nas nationals' um, personal information inside China to designate a legal representative or entity within the territory. So you see the process of re-territorialization of data. Um, finally, China has been quite innovative, I must point out, in addressing certain aspects of personal data protection. For instance, the aforementioned uh, specification actually includes a very detailed privacy sort of user agreement template to guide business uh, for compliance. Uh, for another example, the new data security administrative measures um, also anticipates problems created by new technologies such as deep fake. Right? And so um, actually requires business to designate and label content that is syn as synthetic uh, when the content is created and generated using big data and AI. So I think some of these uh, new proactive measures can really serve as really interesting examples um, as the international regulatory com uh, community um, is grappling with different aspects of uh, data regulation. I'm happy to say more about China's an approach to personal data um, regulation and how, uh, what it means for BRICS countries and other regions. Now before uh, giving the floor to Peter, uh, I just want to make a couple of comments, uh, highlighting that actually we have uh, also in the CyberBRICS research uh, spotted two macro tendencies. Uh, one is that in spite of a formal binding treaty or agreement, BRICS countries are converging towards many elements of the, their national regulations. Uh, principles, for instance, that are enshrined in all the regulations are very compatible. Consent, data minimization, security, accountability, uh, purpose specifications, they are all present in the BRICS. Uh, frameworks or international frameworks. On the other hand, there is still a lot of room for improvement uh, for all the BRICS countries. So the, the purpose of this session and also our research is precisely to uh, map what uh, exists in the BRICS, which is already extremely meaningful uh, in terms of research, as there is no research in this sense so far, and then identify what could be the best practices that uh, uh, BRICS countries, but even all other countries could follow to, on the one hand, 
protect uh, individuals' rights and, on the other hand, of course, create a legally predictable environment for businesses, so to kill two pigeons with, with one stone. Uh, now, uh, I would like to ask Peter to provide his uh, uh, opinion on our debate, uh, not only uh, as the Council of Europe uh, is an organization where uh, Russia is a member uh, since many decades, but also because the Council of Europe is the first intergovernmental organization to have created an international uh, binding framework on data protection, Convention 108. So uh, no one is better, uh, better positioned than the Council of Europe to provide uh, insight and suggestions on how to enhance data protection frameworks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for having me on this panel. Um, so instead of yeah, going through um, the uh, I mean, or outlining uh, Convention 108 and its uh, provisions, as Luca suggested, I would like to drive through the latest development uh, with our relation when it comes to our relations as uh, organization as and as uh, more precisely data protection unit or data protection committee. Uh, towards uh, the BRICS country, uh, big BRICS countries, and um, I must say that uh, when it comes to the f first letters, uh, first two letters, we have some moderate enthusiasm, and and, and the last ones more questions than answers. Um, but without further ado, I I, I would I would uh, like to start with Brazil. And, uh, and the reason for our enthusiasm towards Brazil is that, of course, uh, that Brazil passed the law on uh, data protection legislation, which uh, we have been also following uh, with great interest. And uh, uh, immediately after, or, or uh, even maybe during the process, Brazil have request, has requested uh, observer status to the committee uh, of Convention 108 and participating in our meeting already as an observer um, from the Brazilian representative, but the ambassador uh, will, uh, will uh, um, uh, confirm it uh, that Brazil also wish uh, in the future to uh, consider joining Convention 108 and becoming a party, uh, a party uh, to the convention. When it comes to the second letter, Russia, we now turn to family affairs, as, uh, as you uh, uh, rightly pointed out, that Russia is, mem is a member state of the Council of Europe and is party to Convention 108. More importantly, Russia was among the first signing uh, the amending protocol on, convention on the modernized Convention 108 last year. But we have some issues, and these issues have been discussed uh, with Russian counterparts um, at the uh, technical level as well, but it has also been, uh, so our, my organization was very open about these issues, and uh, namely the data localization and the independence of the authority. Uh, we have uh, been having a um, good feedback from, uh, from, the, um, from our Russian counterparts that they will wish to tackle those issues and to find solutions in the next uh, draft, which is currently at the Ministry of Telecommunication and will be uh, finalized uh, soon, which would also serve as um, as a um, instrument for ratification uh, for the uh, modernized convention, one of it, for the amending protocol. But instead of, uh, in uh, parallel to this, uh, we also uh, listen, we have also listened Minister Lavrov uh, with uh, some concerns when he was proposing to the BRICS country legal, uh, to develop legal framework in the field of fight against cybercrime and data protection. So as a country which is uh, apparently very committed to Convention 108 and to the construction that is going on, at the global level under the auspices of the, or under the framework of the Convention 108, how would this be in, um, um, in line with, uh, with, with BRICS, uh, BRICS um, legal frameworks that are to be developed? In, in, um, when it comes to India, um, 
we are turning to the more question than answers part. Um, and I can only tell you that I participated at an international conference last year where I met the State Secretary uh, from the Minister, Ministry of Justice who is responsible for the draft legislation from the Indian government. And it was during the uh, WhatsApp scam. I, I don't know if you have heard about that or you are familiar with the issue, but all our discussion at this open conference was revolving around data localization. And many agree, argued that India should look into the Russian model and the Vietnamese model in Asia, um, which, uh, which have opted already for some kind of data localization model, which we as Council of Europe and Convention 108 would not favor, and I said this uh, openly, because we believe that uh, the pro any protection framework would have to guarantee an appropriate level of protection of individuals in the digital age while ensuring free flow of data. And besides, it technically it's not possible, uh, and I hope that there are some ICANN fellows here that will also support me on that. Uh, I think that it can create more problem than solutions, but I'm, of course, happy to discuss. Um, when it comes to China, again, uh, the, the, my, our questions just uh, goes on. Uh, our questions just go on. Um, very similar to India, I met the, um, <clears throat> one of the, the responsible uh, of the Chinese government for the new um, legislation at the closed door meeting organized by the GSMA, for which we are very thankful. And we could have uh, a discussion on, on the issue of privacy and the Chinese government um, views on, on the protection of privacy. But that was a closed door meeting, so I would not be able to reveal too much, uh, too much of the information. But it is, uh, it is uh, I mean, to say that we wanted to start some kind of cooperation or some kind of discussion in the framework of our committee uh, where an observer status and, and, and acquiring observer status is a fairly a relaxed procedure uh, for a country or for a state authority or, an inter or a civil society organization as well. But all my emails have been turned down by the firewall. So <laughs> I think that they never got that and um, never get an answer either on that. Um, South Africa is very interesting because we know that there is a very active and very well established data protection authority in South Africa with a, with, a, with a privacy legislation which has been the first in the continent. And although we have a great interest in the African continent and we are providing Council of Europe, technical assistance to many countries in Africa, we couldn't have any, establish any relationship with either with the authority or, um, or the South African government on privacy issues. Um, we hope that in the future that, that will change. There is also a um, African initiative which the Council of Europe support, regional, uh, regional uh, uh, initiative uh, to uh, establish a uh, network of data protection authorities uh, for the continent. We believe that at least via this we will uh, be able to start um, discussion and, and exchanging because we believe that for the, protect for the construction of a protective framework, uh, having these two uh, building block that I mentioned, that appropriate uh, protection of individuals and free flow of data, we need discussions and we need it now. Excellent. And as we still have almost 10 minutes, we may have discussion indeed. So I hope that there will be uh, other uh, comments and questions uh, in the, uh, amongst the participants. If there is anyone uh, from South Africa that wants to chip in and provide some uh, inputs or some feedback on what we have been doing and saying, uh, please uh, don't be shy and take the mic. Uh, do we have any comments from the floor? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, I think you can take one of those mics uh, there.
Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Domenico Fermonte. I'm from the University of Roma III. I'm a sociologist, but trained as a linguist and uh, a cultural studies scholar. So my question to the uh, BRICS uh, aud uh, audience, but also, of course, to the panel is, uh, uh, don't you think that all these personal data and sovereignty and uh, you know, splitting internet, etc. cetera, uh, narrative is also deeply rooted to cultural and linguistic problems. You know, all these uh, effects, you know, all these uh, laws in, you know, in Russia and, and, and to, to an extent also to, in other countries like, uh, not, not just you know, China, but in, in general, it's all Take, you can take one of those mics there on the... Okay, uh, that these, these problems are generated, problems or, you know, outputs are generated by uh, sort of uh, geopol geopolitic, geopolitics of knowledge problem. So there is a, there is also, who will be the, 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 the future, uh, who will be the future rulers of the of the digital knowledge in the future. So it seems like you know, all these things boils down also to cultural and linguistic problems, which you know, are affecting not just the BRICS, but everyone, everyone else in, uh, in, in the world. Because you know, we have companies that, are, that have standards, that have applications, and they are basically anglophone. Uh, do we have any other comments before we uh, provide replies? Yes, please go ahead. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Eduardo. Uh, I'm a Brazilian research too, but I'm here to represent uh, Brazilian youth. And it's a great pleasure to, he to be here, giving a voice to Brazilian youth at IGF. Uh, my question is about the National Data Protection Authority. Uh, in the BRICS vision, uh, is there a BRICS consensus on the performance of that protection authority? And do you think the authority should be independent of the state or supported by it? Uh, how to prevent it from being extremely financially punitive from companies? And what would be her best course of uh, action, exposed, ex ante, proposed policy, or back? best practice. Thank you. Yeah, Anya has a question as well. Yeah, I have a question for Peter, actually. Um, because, I mean, I again had to think also about some of the comments in that uh, digital sovereignty session, which I'm not sure if you were there. But when you said, like, you need to balance data protection and the free flow of information, but I think, like the ambassador said, the, the challenge to maintain the free flow of information the inequality of power relationships on the internet has to be addressed, and the enormous control that some uh, companies have on the internet has to be addressed. And the argument I was trying to make is that I think in India it is having an effect on our data protection legislation and the proposals that are being made that this is not being addressed, right? So it is easy to keep saying, like, there should be a free flow of data. And I'm saying that as somebody who does not believe that we are going to benefit as users from the assertion of national sovereignty over the internet, but we're clearly also not benefiting as users from the assertion of uh, US companies' monopolies over the internet. And it speaks a little bit to the question about the cultural values as well, right? So I wanted to know, does the Council of Europe have to say more about that also? And what and might be a way in to resolve that? I will just take a last question and then we can uh, finalize the panel. The answer after the question, please, Andre. One sec. <laughs> One sec. Thank you. Um, I'm Kian. I'm from France. Um, I work at WTO, but I'm speaking on my behalf. I would like to come back on these data localization requirements. The question is simple. Why data localization requirements? Because there are alternative methods to address, for example, competition. We can think about data trusts that can be a model for privacy. We can increase um, users, online users' control over the data with more transparency, right? So why, for example, in Russia, the government has taken the approach of having data localization requirements, or in India, they are thinking to do so. As I agree with the gentleman from the Council of Europe, 
free flow of data is better in terms of trade at least. And for addressing policy objectives which are legitimate, we have alternatives, right? So why? Thank you, uh, thank you, Luca. Uh, I'd like to uh, address all, all of the participants that uh, participants that asking about national sovereignty. Uh, my deep belief, my deep uh, belief that uh, there could be no sovereignty over the internet, and of course, uh, one of the first uh, authors of the questions uh, uh, is absolutely right that connected uh, that localization provisions with uh, the sovereignty over the internet when we introduced in 2016 the data localization now we introduced the sovereign internet law and uh, this trend of course is uh, really negative the only possible uh, things to answer is to develop international frameworks, uh, I believe, that developed in the multi-stakeholder environment, like this, where we are here. Uh, and so, uh, uh, this is the only, uh, uh, otherwise the internet could be actually uh, uh, just dismissed into the national segments and uh, people around the world will, will lose uh, uh, the greatest opportunity, uh, opportunities ever for communication. Uh, thank you. Anyone else willing to address the questions? Uh, I have also a comment that, uh, uh, that actually resonates with what we were, was said before about seeing the, not only the perspective, the narrative of data localization, versus free flow of information, but also the perspective, I think is necessary to see also another side of the coin, which is uh, f the free flow entails a bi-directional flow of information. Uh, when it becomes an avenue for uh, a scramble for data to extract data unilaterally from one nation and bring it to foreign servers where value can be extracted and also taxes will not be paid in the uh, in the uh, uh, country where it is extracted because data of course is an immaterial good that will not be uh, uh, on which uh, taxes will not be levied if it is uh, processed and value is generated in a foreign server then one can understand that actually data localization it's of course linked to sovereignty, but also it's deeply intertwined with protectionism and uh, the, the, the feeling that many countries, especially those with huge populations producing huge amount of data, are starting to, uh, to think about uh, data as a resource and the fact that the free flow of information actually uh, on paper looks like a great exchange uh, of information but in, in practice looks like a drilling and draining of a valuable information out of a country into a foreign uh, country where those uh, data are accumulated and then uh, value is extracted. So uh, I think it is necessary also to have this kind of perspective in mind. Now, uh, sorry if I, again, uh, I abuse of my moderator perspective to speak too much. Uh, I, see, I think uh, other panelists have uh, uh, replies on this. Thank you. And it's, uh, your comment uh, saved lots of, 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 of space, so I don't need to go back to what you said. Uh, I just wanted to answer Eduardo. Uh, 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 he asked about if there is a common, a common understanding uh, in BRICS countries about data protection. Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, uh, the, the, the political, economic, uh, social systems in the five BRICS countries are very different. And, uh, uh, this translates into uh, uh, different approaches to, uh, as you just uh, heard, different approaches to, to data protection. Uh, we just we are just finishing the, the Brazilian uh, pro tempore presidency of BRICS. Uh, what the motto, more or less, that uh, I don't even know if we, if we said to the to the to the to, to the other BRICS countries. I think we did, but uh, it was our 
uh, or fought internally as we prepared for the presidency, which I, I think it was a pretty successful presidency, was uh, cooperation, not coordination. So let, let's seek uh, avenues of cooperation that uh, are beneficial to, to, to the to the British countries, but not necessarily are going to have the same coordinated position on, on, on X, Y, and Z. Uh, if we don't, we, we, we exchange. If, if we don't, we, we take note of that. It's a, a, a little bit different than the situation, let's say, within Mercosur, where we do need seek coordination, or in the context of the agreement with the European Union, where, where we see the need for in the context of, uh, of uh, what will be uh, an association, a free trade agreement, uh, we see the need to bring the legislations together uh, uh, much more. Uh, so these are totally different animals, the, the, let's say the Mercosur, European Union, and the BRICS, and both uh, are available. Uh, then uh, my last comment about the question by Professor Rossi, right? Rossi, uh, Domenico, uh, uh, Domenico Rossi? Domenico, uh, I found your question fascinating. Uh, it uh, gave me the the, the, <coughs> the desire to hear you present it for an hour. Uh, the, this kind of the whether the divide that we see in the world is a linguistic or semiotic uh, divide. Uh, 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 my own uh, taste for philosophical inquiry. Uh, led me to, to, to believe there is something concrete and truthful about uh, what you said. Uh, uh, we, we live in a world in which different, uh, let's say, regimes of, of truth uh, are competing for space. Uh, who gets to decide what's true, what's false? Now we, we have this concept of fake news. Who has the authority to say that s some piece of news is truthful or fake? Uh, and there is a relationship of power that's involved in this, uh, 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 in, in this debate. Uh, uh, in my, uh, my government uh, uh, was com campaigned last year and was elected uh, on a premise of, uh, of uh, strengthening of Brazilian sovereignty. So we tend to be more soberanistas or pro-sovereignty than today, 2019, than maybe we were 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And uh, we're not uh, isolated in that. It's a general tendency. Uh, but the, sovereignty, uh, the assertion of sovereignty doesn't mean isolationism. And uh, uh, also our policy is a policy of a trade opening to the world. We, don't, we, need, we want to lower trade barriers and at the same time assert sovereignty. That's why I thought it was particularly interesting uh, to hear the speech by Chancellor Merkel uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, because uh, some, sometimes the debate here at the IGF, you have the people who are pro-sovereignty against the people who are pro-global internet. And uh, she was very uh, 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 keen to note that uh, she uh, defends uh, digital sovereignty inside a global, single, free internet. And uh, that's why in the other round table said that that's an exercise of... Uh, German or Hegelian dialectics, you know, that, uh, that seems to me to be particularly fruitful. And, uh, and uh, sometimes we tend to look only at the trade or economic side of things, uh, but uh, the uh, professor here, he also said behind these questions, sometimes there is also a philosophical uh, debate. Uh, what does it mean to be, to be, to, to be sovereign, sovereign in an open world? Uh, it, it, it is a question that uh, will stay, stay with us for a, for a long time. But uh, we, uh, the, I think the, the, the Brazilian people, and I think that's something that transcends the left-right divide, uh, do not want uh, to be just passive adapters of whatever is decided in the so-called global community. No, we, we want to make our own choices and uh, 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 implement them as, as, uh, in an open world without isolationism, without, that's, that's the challenge. That's the challenge that, uh, that we all face. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much for your remarks. I would ask the other panelists if they want to provide some final remarks, uh, not more than one minute, because we should wrap up as soon as possible. Please, be my, be my guest. I have an answer, Dave. Yes, question. Yes, so, 
the only one that may take more than one minute is Peter because he hasn't answered the question. Yeah, you know, very quickly because uh, time constraints and uh, it will be practically challenging in, uh, to, uh, to do this in a nutshell. But uh, we have, um, we have, um, we are, we have the starting position that the right to privacy as defined by Article 12 of the United the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights is an individual uh, but universal human rights and every state has a positive ob obligation to uphold and to protect these human rights. It is an individual human rights which belongs to the person and which is in relation that you also refer to informational self-determination and uh, autonomy and also human dignity to a certain extent in certain circumstances. But this is not a collective right. It is an individual right. And the, m more than 40 years of the ECHR case law have made a very good distinction that we reproduced, uh, the legislator reproduced in the Convention 108, the modernized form, what is the difference between human rights and state interests, like public security. You can balance human rights against each other, human rights, pri right to privacy, right to freedom of exp uh, expression, you can balance against each other, but you will not balance human rights against public security. What you will do and what the state should do according to our court of human rights is that include into uh, the, the protective framework, all, uh, all uh, consideration necessary to protect and to uh, and to uh, to uh, protect and uh, also to um, respond to state interest and 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 uh, and also to uh, keep public security. So there are extended negotiations all around the world, but also in in the international data protection. Uh, community, uh, uh, and I'm just mentioning some of the latest cases, like I'm sure that Facebook would not be very favorable to be, again, fined $5 billion next year. I'm also pretty sure that the discussion by, of dismantling Facebook, uh, not on privacy grounds, but on different grounds, uh, with also uh, at the United uh, at the U.S. Senate will lead to a conclusion. Also, um, the Google in Europe has been fined recently by CNIL. Uh, not the first time, Schrems two cases is before the court. So what we believe in is basically uh, when you want to protect the rights uh, of your individual, when you want to protect your individuals in different circumstances, is that you have to, um, you have to uh, refer to the data security provisions of the, of, of the modernized convention 108, but you should not um, mix this up with cybersecurity and with fight against cybercrime. Then there, these are also different disciplines that have to be tackled in a combined way. And at the end of the day, you will have, you will, you will, you will uh, have, and you will arrive to a, a reach a protective uh, framework where individuals can still uh, uh, operate automatically. So I, we believe that it's better to take part in these international and multilateral uh, negotiations because data sovereignty is basically an answer uh, to uh, the claim, which I don't believe. It's, it's true that multilateralism is not working and it's not effective anymore. Okay, uh, do we have any other comments before we finalize? I mean, yes, please. Uh, it sounds like there are different interpretations of sovereignty and, you know, uh, from this afternoon's um, data sovereign, uh, internet sovereignty session, we heard Vince Cerf, for example, asserting sort of the internet has, is sovereign in its own right, right? And then the other people arguing about Nash, nation state should have its sovereignty and you can also argue all these companies, um, internet giants, they're sort of sovereign in their own right and um, extracting a lot of values out of the system. So we shouldn't be treating the internet as a wonderful, you know, flawless, um, you know, infrastructure for free of information without considering the socioeconomic, un, you know, infrastructure that has, that's been erected over the 20, past, you know, 20, 30 years. And then there is the argument that individuals should be sovereign in his or her own right, having control over their data and also having control over their body. And so um, how does that factor into this, uh, you know, conversation about sovereignty? I think more needs to be said about that perspective as well. Um, in terms of value and extraction of value, I think there's a huge imbalance in terms of the user end and the company end. You know, for example, Amazon is a trillion dollar company. It pays zero tax 
federal tax to the United States federal government. How is that fair, right? And so I think the U.S. government has to think about processes and other governments have to think about processes of getting a fair share um, and fair shake out of the system. That is uh, grossly unfair and unjust right now. I think there's a link between the question about geopolitics of knowledge, sovereignty, and the question of data localization. And I think one part of the answer is actually what Luca said earlier, how important data as a national resource has become. And in the context of India, it's important to understand that the government is also looking at initiatives to make data from companies like Uber, for ex that Uber gathers about what people do and traffic lights available to startup communities in India to build uh, apps on top of, et cetera, or whatever, like products, right? So they're really looking at this as a, a, a way to build a data ecosystem that actually builds value for Indian people based on data from Indian people rather than exporting it outside. But in addition to that, so the cultural arguments, it's not as if the cultural issues don't matter, but they don't play into the sovereignty debate. This is really about hardcore geopolitics and about national interests, it's about money, and it's also really fundamentally about security. The Indian government has been looking for ways to get access to data, to break encryption, to have data localized, at least as early as 2011, when they tried to get BlackBerry to actually give them access uh, to the encrypted data on Blackberries and were successful in the end. And that, that has been a continuous threat. They have looked at different arguments, including hate speech on the internet, for example. And it's like now it seems finally this is coming to a conclusion where it seems acceptable. But these are really the two things, money, economics, and secure, national security. And the security issue, just to say, I do think it's also real, right? We have. In Delhi, we've had terrorist attacks in the center of Delhi. We've had this in Bombay, actually, 26th of November was the anniversary of an attack in Bombay where 200 people lost their lives. It's real. So it's a complicated question in that sense. I would like to thank everyone for the excellent presentations, comments, questions. Uh, I would just like to remind you that if you are interested in the issue, you may find a lot of interesting material on cyberbricks.info. We will release a book in some weeks and actually we will have a panel at CPDP on uh, personal data regulators in the BRICS at the end of January. So a lot of other interesting things for you interested in the BRICS upcoming. Thank you very much for your participation and see you in the next events. Thank you very much.